Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, the, as I prayed this morning about who might be here on Low Sunday, you're familiar with Low Sunday, aren't you? That's the one that comes after Easter. Uh, I thought some of you might be here. I'm glad you made it. Uh, the rest of the congregation is resting up for Christmas. Uh, that's, it takes a while to rest up for that. So uh, just pray for them, and they'll catch their breath. Um, it is still Easter. Today is the second Sunday in Easter, and we will hear the rest of the story that we heard last Sunday today from the Gospel of John. So pay attention later as Beth reads that, because that's where the sermon is coming from. Uh, on our way to that, let's look at the back of our order of service. A few announcements. It looks a lot more normal than it did last week. Um, we are not having communion today, right, Tina? <laughs> communion got stuck on there. I think the printer is, uh, is jammed. But we're not having communion. Uh, Wednesday night is a normal Wednesday night. We'll be having gondolier uh, for dinner, so come and, and eat some Italian. And then next Sunday, you see we have a deacons meeting and a church council meeting that day. Uh, there's a couple other announcements on here you can read about the race for literacy and the uh, fundraising for the roof that's going over the education building. Again, uh, we're so glad you're here. Uh, if you happen to be a guest uh, this morning and you haven't done so before, fill out that little slip inside of the order of service and drop it in the offering plate, and that'll help us track you down later and uh, stalk you at your house and your place of business. Uh, we'd like to get you in the church. I'm kidding. You can laugh at that. We're not going to do that, but we would like to know you. Uh, and speaking of getting to know each other, uh, now's the time to stand and get to know the person that's sitting next to you or closest to you. I think I'm supposed to be back up here now. Uh, one further announcement. Tina wants me to make sure you know that we're not going to Gondolier on Wednesday night. It's coming here. Uh, I thought that was clear, but just in case you were really excited, it's coming to the church house.
Easter people, raise your voices. Take the insert in your bulletin. Let's sing together our hymn praise as we stand to sing. We thank you for making us Easter people. We sing your praises and we listen for your words to us and we press onward toward that goal you call us to reach. We're here together in our humanness, with our weaknesses and our insensitivities, even with our lack of faith. But we thank you for the assurances you give us and we accept it with humility. We also ask you to accept the praises we bring you today. Amen. As you're seated, will you take your bulletin? Let's read together our Litany of Hope. We have entered this place in confident expectation. Let us be open to the one who greets us here. God, who is everywhere, welcomes us here. Our hearts are filled with joyous anticipation. This is a special place of meeting and inspiration. We are glad for one another in God's awesome presence. God tests our faith and examines our community. Our Creator gives us counsel and instructs us. Let us praise our God, revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Glory and honor to the one whose spirit we receive. In Christ we are born anew to the living hope. In the Spirit's blessing we know true peace. Sisters and brothers, we celebrate the risen Christ this day and the hope that it gives to our lives and the life of our church. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Peter's Pentecost sermon includes a beautiful passage on the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Christ died and was killed, Peter says, but God raised him up. A reading from the book of Acts. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. You that are, not, you that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you. As you yourselves know, this man handed over to you, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me. For he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. 
For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would be put or that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He is not abandoned to Hades, nor will his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. Here ends the first lesson. And now let us turn aside and prepare our hearts for prayer. God, it is still Easter, and we gather here on this second Sunday of Easter, hearing the echoes of last week, of the glory that happened, the echoes of a glory that happened thousands of years ago, that we gather here to uh, work with and to think about and to pray over uh, each day of the year. God, we come here. And we always come carrying burdens, carrying concerns and thoughts from our lives out in Middlesboro and beyond. We ask that you will take those during this hour and hold them for us as you hold us in your arms. Hold us close. Open our hearts that we may hear a word in one of the songs, in one of the prayers, in the sermon, wherever it is that we may hear a word. God, we pray for the many that, uh, that are in the world that need attention, that need medical attention, that need psychological attention, that have any kind of, any kind of need, whatever it is. God, we pray for all of those as we pray for ourselves for the very same things. We do this as we always do with the Lord's Prayer the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And we pray that here as we do each week in one bold voice, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our response to prayer is number 392, Open Our Eyes, Lord.
have any children in the audience? If you do, I, I guess that means what, about 12 years and under? Something like that? Uh, there you go. That doesn't include me yet, though. <laughs> Come on down here. I got something for you. I think you might like it. Come down. We'll talk about something. And uh, I always like to bring a little gift for for our young people. So, so uh, that's good. All right. I know there's more here than just you, but this is enough. Hi there. You all look great today. You know, did you have a pretty good time? You can sit down if you would like. Yeah, go ahead and sit down. It's fine. Get comfortable. Yeah. Did you have a pretty good time last uh, week at Easter? You know, did you have a pretty good time? Did anybody hunt any eggs? Yeah, I think some of us did. I didn't, but I sure watched a whole lot of, uh, a lot of you all do that. You know, uh, there's a little more to Easter than that. Jesus, Jesus did something for us. That's what Easter's about, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and every now and then, it's good to meditate and think about what Jesus did. Can somebody tell me what, what Jesus did for us? I won't put you on the spot. As good as you all look, I could put you on the spot because you, you would do well. Jesus died for us, didn't he? He gave everything for us, you know, and, and uh, so that we could have a relationship with him because there was something that separated us from, from him until he died. But yes? Um, why did he die for us? Why did he? Because we have to have forgiveness because of, you know, we make mistakes. We all do. And, and he died so that we could have forgiveness. And God could forgive us. And, of course, we have to ask him to do that. You know, uh, you remember the stories there about... Uh, yeah, about I have a God story. You have a God story? Yeah. Well, let me tell you mine first, okay? <laughs> you remember, and then we'll, we might get to yours, okay? Cool. Well, that's okay, you know. Got the story I'm going to tell is in the book too. It's in the Bible. You remember hearing about the uh, about the blind man that Jesus healed? You remember hearing about him? I heard that in the other, in the other church. Okay, that's good. So you've heard it, yeah. yeah. But you remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, "Go and and see the priest and don't tell anybody what I've done for you." Do you remember that? Yeah. But what did the blind man do? He didn't, he didn't listen to Jesus, did he? He went and told everybody what, what this man, he said, what this man had done for him. He didn't actually know that it was Jesus to start with. So, uh, But that, that's not what Jesus wants us to do. Jesus wants us to, to do what? To be quiet about Jesus? Is that what he wants us to do? You think so? No, it's the other thing. He wants us to tell others about what he has done for, for me and for you and you and you. Yes, all of us, everyone. That's correct. Amen. Well, you've got something I never had. I never had a, a brother. I've got sisters, but anyway. Well, that's, that's cool. I like that. But Jesus, that's wonderful. Jesus, Jesus can be our brother too. He is. He's called that in, in the Bible. We hear about that. So, But uh, he wants us to love him and tell other people about him, okay? So let's, let's go to him right now and talk to him a little bit. Now, once we're done, I have something for you here, okay? So don't just run off. I got something you might like. At least I hope you do. Let's talk to Jesus and to the Father right now. Great and awesome God that you are. Thank you for loving us like you do. Thank you for including Jesus in your wonderful plan. And thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross and dying for us so that we could be forgiven 
and have a relationship with you. Yes, we desire that very much. Thank you so much now. We love you. And ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So I just gave him a kiss. Gave his brother a kiss? Okay. Well, that, that's your expression of love, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see what we can get into here. Let's see what Grandpa Doug's got for you here. Guys, I, I thought about getting a tractor or maybe a four-wheeler or something like that for you, but you have to forgive me. I, I got this. Got Last week, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene and Peter and the beloved disciple. Today, Jesus continues his resurrection appearances, appearing first to the rest of the disciples and then to Thomas, a reading from the Gospel of John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed him his ha them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the disciples was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later they were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet they have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But they are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Here ends the gospel lesson. Join me in our hymn of stewardship, number 197 in your hymnal. We welcome Glad Easter, and let's stand.
you join me in our offertory prayer? God of life, death, and resurrection, we continue our worship and praise to you today. Too often we live our lives and hoard our resources like those who doubt. Like Thomas, we long to see the scars where humanity has done its cruelty and see the face of Christ before we acknowledge your triumph. Help us to open our eyes to see the scars that are all around us, many beyond the boundaries of our communities. Remind us that you continue to bring life out of death and hope out of despair. May we who have been so blessed with the joy of this Easter redemption be generous in sharing all that we are and all that we have. Help us to see and to show the world the face of the compassionate, risen Savior and Lord of love and life. We pray this in God's precious name. Amen.
Well, like I said before, it is still Easter, and we pick up right in the middle of the text that we heard and started last week, and we, picked up, we pick up this morning with a locked door. The door is locked, and fear hangs in the air. Mary and Peter and the beloved disciple have raced to the tomb, and they have raced back. And they saw different things, and they all believed different things. And they came back, and they rapped on the door. Hey, you in the room, it's Peter. Hey, you in the room, it's Mary. Hey, it's me, open up. When I thought of that, that I thought uh, irreverently perhaps of the movie El Dorado with John Wayne and several others. You know, through that whole movie, if you've ever seen it, it's this refrain where they go to the jailhouse. Hey, you in the jail? It's Mississippi. Open up. That's his name, Mississippi. Uh, they, they do that, and I thought of that, and I don't know if that helps you interpret that passage at all, but I'm giving it to you anyway. Um, so either way, they come. They knock on the door. Hey, it's me. Open the door. I think the Gospel of John paints the picture of a community of people in exile here. Jesus' former disciples now have no leader. Jesus' former disciples now hide behind locked doors, doors locked out of fear that somebody in the religious establishment may be looking for them. That same somebody that put their leader to death on a cross just a few days earlier. The disciples are adrift, wandering in the wilderness of their hearts and of their fears, much like their ancestors did with Moses in the desert of Sinai. They are wandering. And none of them, not even the beloved disciple, uh, whom we were told sees the grave clothes and believes, that's all it takes for him, not even him, is not even he is immune, not even he, because they all go back to the place where the door is locked. The only one that might be immune is Mary Magdalene. A few hours ago, she wrapped her knuckles on the door. Hey, you in the, you in the room, it's Mary, let me in. And she came in and she told them that she had seen Jesus. I have seen the Lord. And she said that to all the disciples. Uh, but, but that was the morning. That was the morning. And evening is coming now. And whatever happened in the morning seems to be fading 
like the sun's light. And all of a sudden, the disciples are locking the doors back again. Locking the doors on the house. Locking the doors on their hearts out of fear. You know, fear does that. It causes us to lock down. It causes us to lock up our hearts and our minds so that we might not get hurt or we might not be in danger. Fear works that way. And Mary's story of meeting Jesus at first raised their heart rates. It raised their heart rates. They were so excited about it. Their, their hearts jumped into their throats. You know that feeling. It's happened to you at some point in your life. But that was this morning. Evening has arrived now. And they lock the doors of the house. The moon is rising. And the disciples find themselves wandering in the wilderness of fear once again. They slide that big metal deadbolt into the wall and barricade the door. And I don't know about you, but I, I do this from time to time. Uh, I don't have a big metal deadbolt in my house, but we got the little one that you probably got. And, uh, and we do that. We lock the doors at night when the sun goes down. Uh, we leave lights on in the rooms that we aren't in. Uh, that might make somebody mad, but we do that because it insulates us against the darkness. It insulates us against the fear that's not in the house. It's in us, in our hearts. We're insulating by flipping those switches. The fear is right here, whispering to our hearts that the story that Mary tells, it's nice, it's a good story. It might even be moving. It's a moving story. But, says fear, it's just a story. It's just a story. Mary's story, as good as it is, as inspiring as it is, is just a story. So the disciples push the door locked. Leave a light on. Lock your doors. The story is good, but it doesn't change the fact that you are alone, says the fear in the disciples' hearts. I'm wondering what memories of fear you have. Fear of your heart's encounters with something that was larger than you that scared you? Or were they acute fears? The kinds that make your heart leap and your blood pressure spike? Uh, were they chronic fears? The kind that you carry around day after day and over time they start to wear you down and make your heart a little smaller, dream a little less? What kind of memories of fear do you have? Because the disciples, the real traction point in this story is the fear. Uh, is it the fear that at a gas station in the middle of the night, this happened to me once, you run into somebody that's been drinking and they're there for another drink and they threaten you? Is it that kind of fear? Is it a fear that maybe the ebb and flow of time is starting to take its toll on your body, on your church, on the economy, on our town? What kind of fears nag at you? What memories of your heart's encounters with fear are bubbling up to the surface as we think? Are you able to recognize them and hold them right here? Or do they rush over you and grip you? Are you able to hold your fear out here and say, this is it, I can look at it? Or does it rush over you and grab a hold of you and refuse to let go? I have to confess that I'm not very good at that sometimes. Sometimes fear grabs a hold of me and refuses to let go. I wish I could say that I always held it out here and said, well, this, this right here is what I'm afraid of but it doesn't always work that way. 
John uses the metaphor of a locked door. Another metaphor that I like for fear is a tight muscle. A tight muscle. If you're a coach or a retired coach, if you're a sports fan, if you're a t-ball player even, uh, you learn quickly that a tight muscle is a slow muscle. That a tight muscle has to be compensated for by every other muscle you have. Because a tight muscle doesn't move quickly. Loose muscles do that. A tight muscle, fear is like a tight muscle. It just doesn't want to move as quickly as I need it to. The story in John tells us uh, that we are into the void of fear with the disciples. We are there with them and we are waiting with them behind that locked door and that is when Jesus appears. Now there's a lot of miraculous stuff going on here like how does Jesus get through a locked door and uh, I'll leave Crawford to explain that to you sometime. Uh, he, he says he's got it. So uh, we'll, we'll skip over all that stuff and we'll just talk about Jesus shows up behind the locked door in the midst of the fear. And what does Jesus do? Jesus breathes on the disciples. He breathes on the disciples. Kind of like God breathed into the first human being all the way back in Genesis. Jesus breathes on the disciples and he says, Peace be with you. Receive. Receive the Holy Spirit, he says. Into the fears that close their hearts and constrain their breathing, Jesus breathes peace. Could it be? I think that's the question we ask ourselves in Eastertide. Could it be the disciples' story of hope is what uh, the disciples' story of hope is for us what Mary's story of hope was for the disciples. We're one tick removed. Uh, that's where we are in the text. And we find ourselves, like the disciples, going, could it be? Lock the door. We hear the story. We hear the excitement. Mary's got plenty of excitement. She's just sprinted two and a half times to the tomb. She's got plenty of excitement. And we stand and we listen, but we weren't there. And we say, could it be? Maybe we should lock the door just in case. And then, of course, there's Thomas. Thomas the character in the Bible that preachers and theologians have probably forever branded as doubting Thomas, right? We don't think of Thomas without thinking of doubting Thomas. Thomas has been portrayed as the most fearful of the disciples, the naysayer, the one who refuses to believe, the one who doubts. Uh, in contrast to the beloved disciple who we read about last week, who just kind of glances in the tomb, looks at the clothes land there, and he's good enough. I got it. I believe. Deci or Thomas can't get there. He just comes across, as preachers and theologians and teachers have said for many years, the doubter, the cynic, the questioner, or the scientist, I guess, the logician, whatever it is. Uh, Thomas says, unless I see the nail holes in his hands and put my finger in that hole, unless I can stick my hand out and touch that side, I will not believe. It's bold, Thomas says. And yet, uh, doubting Thomas, cynical Thomas, whatever we want to call him, uh, I notice that there's a detail in the text that gets overlooked sometimes. And that detail, we don't talk about it much, but the detail is he wasn't in the room. He and Mary were the only two that weren't locked behind the door. 
this doubter, this cynic, whatever you want to call him. He doesn't show up until later. And then Thomas raps his knuckles on the door. Hey, you in the room. It's Thomas. Open up. He walks in not to Mary telling the disciples about what she saw at the garden. He walks in to everybody in the room excited. They had just seen Jesus. And they are bubbling over about it. And you got to think that Thomas uh, was in a little bit of shock from this. He left wherever he went. He comes back and everybody says, we saw Jesus while you were gone. Ah, right. You're trying to get me, aren't you? It's almost natural. It's almost human. Um, We're not told where Thomas went, but uh, I imagine that Thomas might have went for a walk in the twilight to clear his mind. I imagine that he might even have walked over to that wooden cross that's cold now and put his hand on it and pondered what had happened. Wherever he went, the fact remains that Thomas was not in the room when Jesus showed up. He wasn't, like Mary, locked into the room with the rest of the disciples. Doubting Thomas has always bothered me. Beth asked me this week, she said, are you, gonna, are you one of those guys that's going to say something about doubting Thomas? And I said, yeah, I got to. I'm sorry. But it's just not fair. Um, and I thought about what adjective to replace doubting with, and I came up with the adjective brooding. Brooding. Brooding is kind of the full contact version of thinking. Brooding is that deep, quiet, agonizing kind of thinking that you feel in your chest, that you feel in your limbs as you ponder something. You feel it there as much as if not more, than you feel in your head. If you've ever seen, and I'm going to butcher this, it's is a French name, uh, Auguste, Auguste, Auguste uh, Rodin. One for two. Uh, if you've ever seen, you don't have to remember that name, but if you've ever seen his sculpture, The Thinker, and you probably have, you might even have a bookend with The Thinker on it. You know what I'm talking about. The thinker is brooding. This this man is sitting on a rock, on a rock, and he's got his knees together and his elbow is on his knee and he's got his face with a furrowed brow and a perplexed look resting on a closed fist right here or right here, depending on the bookend you have. I don't know what, what that says. But yeah, it's a closed fist he's resting on. The thinker is brooding. That's what brooding looks like. Another instance of brooding is in the message, that translation of the Bible by Eugene Peterson. And I really like this one. It's in the first two verses of Genesis, or uh, where it says, first this, this is the message, first this. God created the heavens and the earth. All you see, all you don't see. Earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. God's spirit brooded like a dove above the watery abyss. Later, God will breathe, but first, God broods in Genesis. Brooding Thomas, then, is my offering to you, Beth, uh, instead of doubting. Brooding Thomas feels better to me than mere doubting, because I think there's more to Thomas than this writing off uh, that we have often gotten. Now, I love the story of, um, of Jesus' appearance to all these characters in John. Uh, I love the appearances to Mary Magdalene, the disciples, and brooding Thomas. I love to read and reread these stories. I like to tell them aloud, um, 
they're just so evocative. They're so good. But I have to admit that inheriting them to preach on is a different kind of thing. Uh, the preacher that I am, anyway, started to brood last week when I thought, what do you say when you inherit this story for a Sunday morning? What do you say to that? Words don't work well for something that big, that important. So we just tell the story every Easter and hope that the story carries the freight. Trust the story and trust God to get us there in its hearing. And as we do that, I think, uh, I think things bubble up because the story is so rich. And that's where the sermon title came from, the bubbling up process. We start to identify patron saints in this story. So here's some patron saints in the story. Mary Magdalene. Some of you look toward Mary Magdalene. And if you do, if you say, yeah, that's my patron saint, you're a person with a large heart, capable of much love. You probably weep easily, and you cling to Jesus even when nothing else is going right, with both arms, both hands, when everything's uncertain. You know Jesus' voice when you hear it, if you're Mary Magdalene. And you people that uh, embrace Mary Magdalene are beautiful people. Your love makes our congregation beautiful. Some of you look at the beloved disciple and you say, that's my patron saint. You only need to rest your eyes on those clothes cast aside and you believe. You believe uh, that easily. I guess it's easy. I don't know. Uh, because the beloved disciple is not me. But it must be. It looks easy. And you are the anchor or the yeast of our congregation because out of you our faith rises. You keep us grounded. You keep us centered. And you always keep us focused on the most important things. As we like to say around here, first things first, right? That's the beloved disciple. Some of you, uh, I won't mention any names, look to Peter. Now Peter... Uh, as we know throughout the story, is full of zeal, full of life, conviction, and able to run a mile in under four minutes, it looks like. You bring a tenacity for life, an energy that we need around here. We need Peter around here. You keep us driving forward, even when everybody else goes, well, I don't know if we should do that. The Peter in us pushes on, pushes forward. Make sure that we're still doing God's good work here and not stalling out. And then lastly, of course, there's Thomas. Uh, with more questions and answers, uh, you Thomas folk won't take Mary's word for it. And you probably look at Peter and say, ah, let's just take it easy, Peter. Let's slow down a little bit. We need to think about this a little more. You are the brooders. You keep us honest. You keep us honest. You keep us in tune. You keep us asking good questions. Patron saint that Thomas is. You really, in the story, only ask what everybody else has already had. I don't know if you ever realized that. Thomas only asks for what everybody else already got that he missed. You ask to put your finger in that hole and your hand on that side. You want to touch what is real. Experience it for yourselves. Now, this is the roster of patron saints in this story. And how does that mix with the fear? How does that mix with the fear? Well... It's pretty simple, really. We're all different. And when fear starts closing doors in our hearts, things like this happen. The Thomas types start saying, well, you know, I don't know about those beloved disciple types. They just believe everything 
all the time. It just comes so easy for them at face value. Do they really belong here? When fear takes hold and begins to lock doors, the beloved disciple types might say about the Mary types, well, you know, uh, I don't know about them. They seem awfully touchy-feely for me, prone to emotionalism even. Believe, yeah, I'm all for believe. I'm the beloved disciple, but let's keep it dignified, okay? Let's keep it even-keeled. Let's not get carried away. Do they belong here? If fear takes hold, uh, the Peters, uh, the Peter types in the group, uh, they, they kind of look at the Thomas types. And they say, well, you know, I don't know about those Thomas types. I don't know about them. They sit around and they brood and they think and they just talk it to death. Have you ever been on a committee with a Thomas type? You know, we never get anything done. Do they belong here? But you hear that, right? That that's the fear talking. Because the truth is, the answer is yes. Yes, 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 and yes. They all belong here. And the text says as much. Because the text has Jesus show up in the midst of every one of them. The risen Christ. And they all come to belief. Thomas's climactic phrase in the John Gospel is, My Lord and my God. It's not Mary, the beloved disciple, that says that it's Thomas. Thomas the doubter that we call him. Thomas the brooder. Jesus, the resurrected, risen Christ, is the sinner, not us. And that is why all these types belong here. And that is what will pull us past fear of ever saying that none of them fit. Amen. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. Our hymn is 209. Let's stand together and sing. now as we go from this place, uh, hear now this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance to you and give you peace this day and every day. Amen. Amen.